Hey everyone, welcome. I am Dr. Tony, and I am so glad that you are here today. I want to talk today about suicide. And the reason I want to talk about that is because it is September of 2023. And September is the month where we dedicate really an intentional focus to the prevention and the awareness of suicide, which is something that we continue to see troubling statistics around. We continue to see folks all walks of life struggle in these areas. And if you are someone in my audience who resonates with being a leader, an achiever, or a parent, there are so many silent struggles that happen amongst those populations those that look like they're really successful on the outside, they're really ambitious, they're keeping it all together, doesn't mean that's how they feel on the inside. And so what I want to do today in honor of Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month this September is I want to share with you a chapter that I wrote in uh, the Wellness Universe Guide to Complete Self-Care, 25 Tools for Stress Relief. And the reason I want to share it with you is because it is my experience of when I was put into a mandatory hospital stay because of my question around, is there still more life for me to live? Is there still more purpose for me to fulfill? And so if you are someone that either yourself or you know someone that is or has experienced this internal struggle, often silently without other people knowing. My hope is that in sharing my story, you don't feel as alone. There are many resources that are out there and I'm not going to speak what the resources are because they sometimes change and get updated. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in the description below. That will make it easier for me to edit them if they change or get updated over time. There's text lines, there's phone numbers, there's websites. If this is something that you or someone that you care about, someone that you know might need support with. This is not any medical advice that I'm offering today. I'm not legally allowed to do that, nor would I be able to do that because I'm speaking to you through video, but I am speaking to you from the heart. And I hope and believe that you will be able to feel that as I read this chapter to you. This is in chapter 12 and it's called Declutter Your Mind, Enhance Productivity Without the Burnout. My story. I looked like an outward success while feeling like an inward mess for as long as I could remember. And to make matters worse, I was in denial about both. It was a nice spring day and I was standing in my dorm room. My typical emotional armor was still on, yet it felt like I was busting from its encasement from the inside out. At the ripe old age of 20, I had long been a pro at setting my mind to something, staying super focused and getting through without complaint or pause for my feelings or needs. I was an achiever. I was a doer, a headstrong, multitasking, autonomous woman. I wore that description with pride, but I hid the immense pressure that boiled beneath it. This particular day, the stream, the steam from that internal pressure cooker was trying to seep out. It was so thick and so compressed from all the years of avoidance, I tried to resist. I paced back and forth. I sat on my bed. I looked at the scissors and then I looked away. I saw the pill bottle and I averted my eyes. I tried to hold myself inside my all familiar, invisible, protective casing, but I couldn't. I felt like I was busting open at the seams as tears began to slide down my face. Even as a sophomore in college, I'd accomplished a lot. I rarely ever asked anyone for anything so as not to be a burden. I was always volunteering to do whatever I could. I was a residential assistant and I had gone above and beyond to create a fun, supportive atmosphere for my rooms of ambitious female engineers. I was up for a bunch of awards as a result and I thought that I had done 
everything that I could to be the best possible me, to show I could be successful, to show I wasn't a stereotype, to prove I could be a value. A's, honors, AP, gifted, extracurriculars, leadership positions, people pleasing and appeasing, asking how can I help while withholding any expression of my own needs for fear of judgment, rejection, or feeling vulnerable. I craved the acceptance that action and achievement brought me. It made me feel like I was doing something of purpose, but I was terrified of living a purposeless life. I needed to help. I needed to do. I needed to give. I needed to do well. I needed to stay strong and I needed to be independent. Vulnerability was a weakness. I couldn't be weak. I felt like I'd learned that lesson straight out of the womb. Be good, Tony. Don't want more than you have. Don't ask, just give. Don't be too emotional. Don't be too loud. Don't be too difficult. Don't be too needy. Do what you have to. Work hard, achieve, be successful, help others. The endless litany of requirements to be deemed good enough played in the background of my mind incessantly. It never felt like a choice. I worked tirelessly because I thought I had to. Control. Control. I felt that I had none of it. And so I constantly grasped for it. If I got good grades, I could control the praise that I got from adults. If I stayed neutral, I could control being the middle peg between my parents during their divorce. If I kept my emotions to myself and just focused on doing well in school and being there for other people, then I could control the possibility of being rejected or judged. Except the more I fought for control, the less in control I felt, of course, the more I wondered what I was doing wrong, what I needed to do more of. Is there something wrong with me? So much of my life felt beyond my control. Constant issues with weight, never really feeling seen or heard by my family or really anyone. The emotional backlash of the divorce always seeming like people were trying to categorize me into boxes that I never fit into. Not black enough, not really white. What am I? Do I even belong here? On this particular spring evening, the buildup sprung a leak. I lost my grip on any semblance of control that I thought that I had had. Like a heavy, wet and weighted blanket, the hopelessness and unworthiness enveloped me. Somehow, the scissors were now in my hand and a handful of pills were already down my throat. My mind wasn't racing so much anymore though. It was focused on one thing now, God, this is your chance to show me. I firmly spoke this in my mind. If I still have purpose to fulfill, show me. If I don't, please let me know. I desperately needed to know. For a moment, I felt relief. I'd finally done something that would show me for sure if I had more purpose to fulfill. I'd finally know that if deeply hidden beliefs that I was meant for big things were actually real, or if it was all just made up in my head. I'd finally get the answers that I've been seeking. Am I worthy? Am I the good kind of different? Should I be alive? Is there still more for me to do? Do I belong here? That relief lasted only a moment as I came back into my physical reality and realized that I needed to stop trying to be so damn independent all the time. And finally, I asked for help. Sobbing, I called, Stephanie, I need you. She rushed over and she drove me to the hospital. Laying on that hospital bed, white gowned, black charcoal in my stomach to rid the toxins. I remember looking at my mom's face. I wondered what she was thinking. 
but I didn't dare to ask. Awkward silence, doctors talking, me still feeling unseen, unheard, and completely misunderstood. They called it attempted suicide. I called it a pleading for guidance, a, a last ditch effort to verify that I indeed have more purpose to fulfill in this life. I was forced to stay on the psychi psychiatric ward for about 10 days. No one listened to me. A grown up man attempted to force himself into my room and onto me. It was my roommate who protected me. My experience was so bad that part of me just tried to forget about it. After an unencouraging talk with the psychiatric doctor, I was released. When I rejoined the public, things were different. I lost my residential assistant position. They redistributed the awards that I was lined up for and gave them to others. I had to leave my fellow RAs and residents without any real explanation. I was mandated to counseling if I wanted to continue with the traveling abroad opportunities that I had already had lined up. It felt like all the action that I had taken, all the work and effort I had put in to be enough, to be better, like it was all for naught. I tried to do my best, give my best, be my best, but it felt like it didn't matter anymore. It felt like the fruits of that labor were just taken away or were threatened to be. I was no longer feeling hopeless. I was feeling angry. At the time, I didn't realize that was actually emotional progress. I guess part of me did die that day. I left those experiences with a different outlook on life. I wasn't feeling hopeless anymore, but I did feel a renewed sense of purpose. And for the most part, no one knew I was dealing with anxiety and depression. If I'm honest, I guess I didn't know that either. I felt so misplaced, like I didn't fit in or belong for so long that the anxiety and depression experience, it had just become my familiar. Along the beginning stages of my life journey, what I had learned is that if I just worked hard to please others, accomplish goals, or exceed expectations, People were generally pleased with me. They liked me or at least acknowledged me in some positive fashion, even if only momentarily or situationally, and that felt good. It was reinforcing, but that feeling, it just never lasted long. I always had to work for more and more and more. The more action I took, the more success I'd show, the more I'd momentarily felt like I'd belonged. Action had become my drug of choice, and I didn't even know it. I've since discovered that many high achievers, leaders, and compassionate yet independent folks tend to hide their emotional challenges pretty well. So even though I thought I was alone then, I now realize I'm not the only one who suffered in this way. There are so many amazing people out there who are looking like an outward success and feeling like an inward mess, suffering silently inside. I never questioned my life having purpose after that life altering experience during my sophomore year of college. I brought life into this world the following year and became the mom of a heartwarming little girl, my daughter, Jaden. She brought an even more powerful purpose to my life. She reminded me of how precious life is and how powerful we as humans are. We have the power to create to nurture, and to mold our lives. I was determined. I was going to use my power for good. I didn't pause long enough though. My daughter was by my side in classes at a week old. I pumped on the bathroom floor at the university. I went straight into getting my first master's degree as soon as I graduated with my bachelor's. She was on my hip the day of graduation as I walked across that stage to receive my hard earned diploma. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, that spring day marked the beginning of a new era for me. Having my daughter the following year was a clear indicator of the significance of that new era. Despite my renewed sense of purpose and my dedication to crafting a supportive and loving life for my daughter, it took several more years and a few bouts of burnout before I learned how addicted to action I had really become. The pains of my past had been harnessing the reins of my future for far too long. 
I believed that since I had on my emotional armor was focused on achievement, taking tons of action, being super independent. Well, then I was taking control of my life, right? I mean, I thought all of this meant that I wasn't playing a victim role. I didn't want to resonate with feeling like a victim of anything or anyone because it led me back to that place of feeling powerless. I refused to feel powerless. Yet I had let my goals and the veracity of my constant need to do define me. There are plenty of signs that I was feeling out of control and overwhelmed, but I ignored them. I told myself that I could tolerate more and more and more stress, therefore welcoming more and more and more stress. Others may need help and I'll be glad to help them, lead them and support them, but I'm good. I've got it. I just, I don't want to burden anyone. I was the exception. I always found a way to justify constant goal setting, endless action and a lack of self-care. Helping others helped me distract from helping myself. Staying busy kept me from dealing with the underlying emotions and fears that I didn't know how or that I had to address. I thought that over time, it would just all sort itself out, you know? I'd hoped that it'd go away or not affect me or my relationships. I could work hard. I could rise above it. I believed that I had dealt with what needed to be dealt with and could escape having to deal with the rest. But it just compounded itself. That's what happens, you know? No matter how many goals you accomplish, no matter how much money you make, no matter how successful you are, what you look like or how much you help others, if you ignore your own feelings, don't tend to your own needs or think like you have to prove that you belong, it is going to hurt you. It's going to build up. It's going to show up in your life in some way. For most busy, ambitious folks, there's a mental clutter and overwhelm that takes hold. It's frustrating and it can feel debilitating. Action seems like an ideal distraction. It feels productive until it's not anymore until the overaction results in disconnection, self-sabotage or self-doubt or exhaustion or some other undesired consequence of chronically operating in the on mode all the time. The real irony here is that the more we overwork ourselves, criticize ourselves, ignore our emotions and refuse to slow down, the less productive we become. Seriously, research supports this. Our brains can't function optimally when thwarting the communication process between the brain and body by cutting off our emotions. We can't operate when we haven't taken the time to maintain and tend to our own internal systems properly. We're not operating optimally. We don't have as much to give when we're on E all the time. And that's why the mental clutter built up. That's why good people and strong leaders burn out. That's what I had to learn. I had to learn how to do that differently. And when I did, I felt free. That's also why today I want to share a two-part tool that helps with reducing the mental clutter, thereby enhancing our ability to step in, gain clarity, feel better, reduce burnout, and boost productivity, among many other desirable benefits. There's a video with a walkthrough that I'll share with you. I'm going to do that in a part two of this video right here so that those who are really connecting and resonating with my story that I've just shared are able to focus on that or to share this with someone else that may benefit. And for those that are also interested in this two-part tool, you can click the link below and you can head over to part two of this video where I will share that tool and you can use it yourself if you choose to or not, whatever works. In no way, shape, or form is my sharing of my story an indication of how you should or should not handle whatever it is that you are going through. My story is my story. Your story is yours. But if and when we're feeling alone, it's important for us to notice that. And it's important for us to see what we can do to support ourselves when we're in that place. I really appreciate you listening to this today. This story, this is the first time I shared my story like that um, so openly in this book. When I when I wrote it in this book, oh gosh, when was this? Maybe it was in 2020, in 2020. And um, 
it was a big thing for me to be able to do that. A big thing for my myself and my own healing. And since writing this chapter in this book, so many people have reached out thanking me for sharing this story. And so I'm glad that I did, even though it was vulnerable. Vulnerability is not a weakness. Vulnerability takes courage and that's a strength. Until next time.